settling in on this Wednesday evening. I thought I would just paste a few. Um, I have two links of things that are coming up <coughs> that I'd like to share with you all. One is for tomorrow, and the others are for Sunday. And you'll see in your chat function. Um, I've been teaching with Tibet House quite a bit. So on Thursday, which is tomorrow at 4 to 6 p.m. Pacific time, uh, I'll have a conversation with a colleague of mine, Carla Jackson Brewer, about Tantra for Challenging Times and how to work with anger and feelings of despair and, you know, just uh, transmute all the joys and sorrows onto the path, basically what we've been learning here, but in particular we'll talk about the feminine expressions of uh, the Dakinis and the Taras and how these archetypes can help us understand and channel and heal. So all are welcome and uh, that's in the post and then also in the chat is on Sunday from 3 to 5 p.m. Uh, Nina Rao and I do chanting and stories and meditations to the Divine Feminine within both the Hindu and the Buddhist tradition. And we've been doing that once a month for about a year now. 3 to 5 p.m. All are welcome. The link is there. And then the last announcement is that on Sunday morning at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, I'll guide an hour practice on the 8th Tara. There are 21 Taras with different mantras, different iconography, different meanings. And the eight one is particularly about settling disputes. I mean, you know, she's obviously about awakening and full liberation, right? That's a given. <laughs> but then like each of these Taras have little um, special superpowers or big special superpowers that make them unique from the others. And the eighth Tara um, named Jen Miguel Wei Pamo or Tara Aparajita. In any case, you can call her shorthand Tara 8. <laughs> her superpower is about overcoming um, uh, unjust dynamics. So I thought she would be a powerful one to invoke leading up to the election. So we're starting a whole, Tara Mandala is starting a whole like Tara campaign where we do mantras and see how many mantras we can do as a collective Sangha devoted to the 8th Tara, so that'll launch on Sunday at 10 a.m. Pacific Time, so I'm calling her Tara 8 for social justice. Fair and free elections and so on, but we can at least channel our energy in different ways, right? We can be activists, but we can also blend our activism with our contemplative practice and our aspirations and our prayers. So that's what we'll do on Facebook. All you have to do is go to Facebook, type in Tara Mandala Retreat Center. You'll find it will be live at 10 a.m. You don't have to sign up. Don't have to do anything special. Just go to Tara Mandala Retreat page. It's Tara Mandala Retreat Center. And I'd love to bring some of these wonderful friends that I collaborate with here to the SF Dharma Collective so I can talk to Katie about that. Yeah, it's so happy to do that as well and um, spread the love around. <laughs> it's really great teachers. They're East Coasters. So the timing's a little different than normal. A little earlier for us. And some of you might even know Carla. She came to the, to the center long before we morphed into our better half, <laughs> SF Dharma Collective. We, when it was against the stream, uh, we did a whole day long on uh, feeding, feeding your demons of privilege and oppression. We talked about anti-racist work and how we can do the inner work of transforming all the uh, challenging emotions and ways of thinking that can come up around that. She's a very powerful teacher and a mentor of mine as well. Okay, so um, are there any other announcements that Katie would like to make or didn't hear any announcements before? Oh, yeah. We have a couple of things coming up that might be of interest. Um, we, on Halloween in the afternoon Pacific time, we have Kiara Jewel Lingo visiting us. That's going to be in this same room and you don't have to register in advance. You can just drop in. Um, the theme of, of the day that she's going to spend with us, or it's like two and a half hours, which is you know as much as you want to spend on Zoom probably. Um, she's going to talk about meeting uncertainty with awakened tenderness. 
and she's amazing. Um, so that's going to be on Halloween in the afternoon. Um, there are also a bunch more interesting events on our upcoming events page that you can check out, including an upcoming Sunday event with Andrea Beccioni um, called the Dharma of Intimacy. Um, so if that feels like something you're drawn to, uh, check that out. And then if any of you uh, are interested in pushing yourselves uh, a little bit, once a month, we on a Saturday night do a meditation on death. Um, it's relatively intense, like only come if you're feeling resourced. Um, but this Halloween, we're doing a special three hour long uh, edition of our monthly death sangha. And that one is going to meet on its own link. We're not having it in the regular room. So you have to register for that in advance. And I'm gonna put a link to that in the chat right now. Um, so check out one or two or three or all of those upcoming things. And um, I'll also, uh, ah, Mace put some links in the chat. If you are in a place financially where you can, um, with a feeling of abundance and joy, donate to the collective. We would sincerely appreciate it. And if you're not, it does not matter. Keep coming and practicing with us. Um, we, you know, when we started uh, a little over two years ago, two years and three weeks ago, um, we were started on the principle that the Dharma is for everyone and should be accessible to everyone. Um, and your greatest generosity is sharing your practice with us. So thank you all for being here. And Chandra, I'm excited to practice with you tonight. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Katie, for all you do to keep this beautiful Sangha and this collective uh, moving forward and coming together. So let's go ahead and dive in. I'll guide us in a practice. It's about, you know, about 25, 30 minutes. So go ahead and Find a comfortable seat and settle in. So for those of you who are new, uh, we always start with the announcements, get those out of the way, and then we dive into practice. Guided meditation for about a half hour or so can vary a little bit from day to day. And then we have a Dharma talk. And so after meditation, we'll explore uh, the ideas around the mind training texts that we're studying, Lo Jong, and we'll dive into that after we practice. So... Drop-ins are welcome, and we're always glad to see new people. So go ahead and allow yourself to turn inward by closing the eyes or lowering the gaze a little bit. Either way is fine. If the eyes are lowered and the gaze is slightly open, just relax the gaze and feel as if you could see a full 360 degrees around you. So it's like you're developing a lantern awareness, lantern consciousness, rather than spotlight consciousness. So you're softening and broadening and not staring at anything in particular. Or if the eyes are closed, that's fine. Just make sure you don't drift into sleep or spaciness. And as we settle with the breath, coming home to ourselves with the breath, each breath, it's like an invitation to inhabit and to come home to this miracle of the breath in the body. This breath is one of the aspects of our physiology that is both voluntary and involuntary. So with the first few breaths in here, why don't you voluntarily take some deep, luxurious breaths and release tension with the out-breath, any holding in the face, the jaw, the neck, the throat, the chest, the back. Just breathing in to any tension that you may be holding and then breathing out, releasing that tension. Pay particular attention to the belly. Begin by taking some gentle vase breaths. We learned this a while ago. We'll do it again tonight. So the breath is nice and even, without straining. Just for the next few breaths, feel 
Each breath is if you're pouring water into a big vase. So you're filling the torso with the breath from the base to the middle to the top. A pause at the end of the in-breath. And then softening and releasing the breath out as you exhale. Feel as if you're pouring the water back out of the vase. So the breath leaves from the top, the middle to the bottom. Take a few more breaths like this, just filling with the in-breath, pausing for just a count or two with the in-breath full, and then gently releasing with the out-breath. So we're voluntarily slowing the breath down a little bit, which helps to slow the mind, calm the mind down. Let the belly be soft, loosen your belt or your your pants if you need to, you want the belly to be soft, the kidneys relaxed and nourished back and down. The chest is buoyant, the shoulders down the back, reaching up through the crown of the head. And let the tip of the tongue rest at the upper palate right at the root of the top front teeth, and then relax the jaw. Continue to breathe with the in-breath, filling from the torso to the middle to the top. And then gently exhaling, softening from the chest, the middle, solar plexus region down to the belly, softening a gentle pressing in, just a gentle one to let the breath come out. And now we'll introduce another step to make it more of this pranayama called the vase breath, the kumbhaka. So let's all align by exhaling the breath together. And then when you're ready, slowly inhale about the count of five. One, two, three, four, five. And then hold the breath in. Five. One, two, three, four, five. And slowly breathing out. One, two, three, four. Five again. So about this rhythm, you don't have to really count, but just that even in breath. And as you hold the breath in now, some gentle pointers here. Let the chin drop a little bit so you have this kind of gentle closing feeling at the throat. Let the belly soften out and let the perineum slightly pull up and in. And then when you need to, gently breathe out, smooth like silk, exhale slow. Don't spit it or cough it out. Just slowly breathing out. And before you're completely empty, turn back around and breathe in, really drawing the energy down into the bowl of the pelvis, the navel center. Let the belly soften out. Hold the breath in, chin down. Shoulders down and back, belly soft. Keep holding the breath in. Lift a little at the perineum, closing the lower doors. And then when you need to, without strain, exhaling slowly. Before you're completely empty, so when about 10% is left of the breath, you turn around and refill it. So you're packing in energy at the navel center. Holding it, relax the mind. Let the mind go still as you hold the breath. There's a silence there. And then when you need to, slowly breathe out. Make sure not to have any tension or strain with the breath. Let's do a few more rounds with your own pace and silence.
Now releasing any control of the breath and breathe naturally. Shifting into the involuntary mode of breathing. And let that relaxation and that quietude guide you into meditation here. Just continuing to feel the flow of the breath in and out of the body. Become aware of this simple presence of being, being in the moment, being in the body with the breath. You may notice sounds, temperature of the air, taste, smell, and so on. Just notice within this broader space of this quality of being in the moment with the breath in the body. Stabilizing the awareness with the attention to the breath now. Really feeling the sensations of the breath as it flows in and out of the body. And we'll attend to the breath as the anchor for about 21 breaths. For the top of each inhalation, you can gently count internally one and so on with each breath. Releasing distraction as soon as you recognize it and come back to the flow of the breath, the sensations of the breath as they flow in and out of the body. Training the mind like you would train a child or a puppy how to stay gently again and again, just staying with the breath, coming back. Counting from one to 21, or if you wish, don't count, I will, and we'll move on to the next phase after 21 breaths. The counting can help stabilize the mind.
we'll shift the anchor of our shamatha practice from breath to the mind. Settling the mind in its natural state is a shamatha practice that takes the mind itself as the anchor. And when I say mind, I mean in this case the domain or the space of the mind. It's not that we chase after this thought and that thought. Instead, we rest in that spacious awareness of thoughts coming and going, impressions arising and passing. And this practice is done with the eyes slightly open. So if the eyes are closed, slowly open them and gaze at a comfortable angle. Just past the nose. Soften the gaze. Feel free to blink whenever you need to. Make sure the face is relaxed, the muscles behind the eyes relaxed, the jaw soft. And feel as if you're gazing into the space of the mind itself, as if it were just right there in front of you, between you and the wall, or you and the table, or you and the floor. Just feel as if you could gaze into the domain of the mind, the sense of thoughts arising and passing, sensations, memories, emotions, like actors on a stage, entering and exiting, playing out their dramas, moving on. So rather than fixating on those actors or those thoughts or feelings and taking them for granted or reifying them by clinging or grasping onto them, just lean back in your seat a little more metaphorically and feel as if you're aware of the entire stage, the entire arena, the space within which these appearances arise and fall. The breath is still a gentle, gentle anchor, but not the primary anchor. Just attending to the space of the mind. When thoughts, emotions arise, just note and then release and return back to that quality of observing the space, of abiding within that space. free of grasping, free of distraction. When you connect with that quality of space that's not changed or altered by the thoughts that arise and pass within it, 
stabilize it. Stabilize that experience. The old metaphor is to capture the citadel of awareness. So once you've found it, don't lose it. Stay, stay, and relax and release. feel that healing salve of meditation the mind finally lets to go let go of all of its rumination all of its effort judgments activity just unravel all of that let it all go and rest in that presence that mindfulness of the space of the mind Gently allow the eyes to close for the last phase of our practice, Donglen, this compassion practice of sending and receiving. Allowing the eyes to close and continue to stay present and mindful of the breath as your anchor. And begin with that quality of luminosity at the heart chakra, the heart center, in the form of a luminous orb of radiant light, like the sun, or the size of a golf ball or an orange, whatever feels right to you, and just feel it like a your life force, strong and indestructible, like a thunderbolt or a diamond, a vajra. Dorje in Tibetan, this quality of indestructible nature of your own mind as a luminous 
sphere of light at the center of your heart chakra, the center of your sternum. And just breathe in and out of there for a while. Get used to that feeling and the revelation of, oh, I have that here. I'd have forgotten about it. It's like an uncovering of that energy source, that matrix of life force energy that's there at the heart center. And this plays a very important role in the Tonglen practice. So just feel the breathing in and the out. The breathing in is an aerating the heart of the space, the space of the heart. And the breathing out is a release and an opening to the moment, to the gift of that luminosity. And then with that connection of the Vajra-like orb of light at your heart, also flash on emptiness. Flash on that vast, absolute nature beyond space-time, birth and death. This kind of quality of indestructibility that is the essence of your own spirit or soul or nature of your own mind. insubstantial but luminous appearing like rainbow in the sky. Flashing on emptiness, absolute bodhicitta. And then from that vantage point of that big sky mind of absolute bodhicitta, we engage in the relative bodhicitta practice of the Tonglen, compassion. So let's take about 10 breaths now, focusing on our own atmosphere. Is there anything, emotion, thought, feeling you'd like to welcome home to that luminous orb of light at your heart with the in-breath? Just feeling into what would I like to breathe in now? Maybe it's fatigue or sadness or whatever it might be. Just breathe it in that heart space where the orb of light is shining. And then with the out breath, breathe out a release and then allowing that to come home. Release the resistance and the struggle with the out breath. So continue like this. Breathing in, bringing it home, whatever that might be. And breathing out, releasing and opening that quality of space and that capacity within you to hold all of these pieces, these parts of you, letting them come home. Feeling that quality of tenderness and acceptance of our vulnerability, our humanity. Nobody's perfect and that's okay. Just breathing in and out with yourself as if you were welcoming these aspects of yourself home where they can release and relax and reintegrate, re-energize you. And then having it attended to our own inner atmosphere, now we can attend to some outer atmospheres. <laughs> Bring to mind someone. I'll let you choose whether it's a loved one, a neutral person, or a so-called enemy, challenging person. Just bring them into your mind's eye now. Who is suffering? Who needs some help now? 
an individual person. We'll go to the larger group field next. Just pick one person here and really see them as clearly as you can in your mind's eye. And you can maybe even see that their suffering is surrounding them like a cloud. And with the in-breath, you breathe in that cloud, transform it at the orb of light at your heart, and breathe out a cool, clear, warm, healing light. So you're taking in with the in-breath any challenge or suffering they may have. You're transforming it at the indestructible orb of light at your heart and then you're breathing out the healing rays offering them that relief that wish for them to be free of suffering opening yourself to that really feel a genuine heartfelt wish may they be free of suffering May they be free of the deepest causes of that suffering. And may they find happiness in the deepest causes of that happiness. The next few breaths, really feel that cloud of suffering diminishing, evaporating with each of your out-breaths, clearing it. See their disposition lighten, their eyes sparkle. Really feel and sense them coming into their full health and well-being. And then releasing that visualization. And the next step is to imagine the whole world as if you were sitting from the moon, the vantage point of the moon, gazing down upon planet Earth. And with this kind of Vajra capacity to transform the sufferings on this planet Earth, you breathe in in the form of a cloud, transform it at your heart space, breathe out cool, clear healing remedy. So whether it's strife, violence, hunger, oppression, injustice, environmental degradation, just breathing all of that in, transform it at this amazing orb of light at your heart, and then breathing out a cool, clear, healing light, sending it to blanket the earth in a warmth, a blanket of luminosity that brings balance, relief from suffering, you can imagine specific groups of people, certain areas, spend some time. Really having the courage of the Bodhisattva to breathe in the suffering of the world, transform it at the heart, and breathe out the remedy knowing that this suffering doesn't hurt you, doesn't change you, it's not like you're taking it and lodging it in your body, but rather it evaporates like moisture when touched by the rays of the sun. And then you breathe out that sunlight or that moonlight, soothing the earth and its heat and its anger, beings, 
the environment coming to balance and peace. And take a moment here from our vantage point is, of course, we're from the moon, but we also have a particular investment with this country called the United States of America. Let's take a f some time here to really like clear any obstacles to fair and just elections, fair and just access to truth, to justice, to vote. so that we can turn a corner. A new era dawn. Gently releasing that visualization and just breathe and be in the moment. And then slowly open your eyes, feeling yourself in this room with this, in this body with the breath and coming back now. So just a little note about what we've been doing here. Both Eve and I, who have been trained extensively with a wonderful teacher named Alan Wallace, who focuses on many different beautiful techniques and stages of shamatha. So there's an intentional building here. So if some of you drop in and come and go, other people are very consistent. So, excuse me, I want to just give you a sense of what it is that we're doing here. It's meditation is very interesting, especially in our modern time, because it can be easily confused with relaxation techniques, right? Which it does do, but that's a byproduct. Relaxation is great. It's important, but it's not the only thing that we're doing. With shamatha, we're also cultivating clarity and stability. So those are the three ingredients for a shamatha or calm abiding mindfulness practice, you can say. Relaxation, stability, and clarity. So at any point in your practice, you can ask yourself, oh, how am I doing with those three, you know? Am I relaxed so much that I'm not clear anymore? <laughs> Or am I so stable that I'm tense and I've lost my relaxation? Or also, is clarity so heightened that I get spun out and get excited and agitated? And I've lost my base, my stability, and my relaxation. So you can be your own doctor with your meditation, right? So you can say, how am I doing with those three aspects of shamatha? Relaxation, stability, and clarity. So that's why we always start with some relaxing breath, some, a little pranayama sometimes. I hope that felt uh, s relaxing and stabilizing for you because that navel center is the centralized um, place that we can cultivate stability from. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Allergies. 
So like when Alan teaches that quality of developing stability, he always uses the Zen technique of belly, resting the mind at the belly as you breathe. And we've done that too sometimes. And that Vaz breath does that at the beginning, yeah? So you can actually maintain a gentle quality of the vase breath throughout your whole practice if, if you like it and you have a natural affinity for it. Not the whole breath retention and all the yogic aspects of it, just a gentle awareness of the breath if you want to cultivate more stability. Clarity especially gets cultivated with some different practices, some that we haven't done so much here, but the classic Vipassana like Burmese style is where you eventually start to pay attention to the sensations at the space between the upper lip and the nostril. How many people have practiced that? Yeah, so those people who might have practiced that might have recognized that that creates a very heightened quality of like luminosity or clear mind. Like it's, it's a bit closer to where we think we live, right? <laughs> it's not as hard to kind of touch into as the belly is. But also, um, it, it uplifts the attention, it clarifies, and it inhabits the mind, the, the head center, where clarity really opens. So that's a very good technique for developing clarity, but also settling the mind in its natural state where your f eyes are open and you're focusing on the space of the mind also, in my experience, really enhances clarity. I'm the type of meditator who sometimes I like meditating with my eyes closed. Absolutely. Sometimes that's the right thing. But more often than not, I get sleepy and space out. So for me, the eyes open is very good, and I, I, I love it. But it took me a while to get used to it. So if you're new to that, be patient with yourself and keep trying it. The most important thing is to have the eyes relaxed and blink whenever you need to. After a while, you don't need to blink so much. And the eyes get used to it. But if you're having an allergy attack or if the visual field is very distracting, close your eyes. It's not a big deal. So what we've been doing up till now is we've been stabilizing with some relaxation breaths and then doing some counting maybe or just breath awareness to get you, it's kind of like warming up and then opening into sh settling the mind in its natural state with the eyes open. And that one's a bit more unwieldy, isn't it? You feel that a little more challenging? How many people found that challenging? <laughs> Thanks for turning on your video. <laughs> How many people um, liked it? <laughs> yeah, so it can be challenging and you can like it too, right? <laughs> Why did you like it? And maybe chat it in or unmute yourself. What, did, what about the settling the mind in its natural state did you like? You can either chat or um, or unmute yourself, I think. Katie, can they unmute themselves? I think so. Yeah, okay. we can. There's no right answer here. I'm just curious. Felt more alert, being, strong sense of uh, relief. Why? What was the relief? Just felt like there's this moment of kind of slipping into, I guess, into awareness, but more out of all the little like kind of planning mind, especially for me is a big thing I spend a lot of time in. And there's an extreme peacefulness in dropping that and just resting. And it came with this flavor of like, it's just like, ah, <laughs> with this real relief. Yeah. That's excellent. That's, that's my experience too. When it, when it's happening, you know, when the mind can settle and really do it, then you're like, ah, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> it's so tiring, isn't it? 
planning and thinking all the time. Good. Other people said it increased my concentration. Good. So that's interesting because some people might not feel that at all. Because in a way, it's kind of like you're anchorless. Yes, the space of the mind is your anchor. But it's a it's kind of a spacious anchor, right? It's spacey. It can, we can go spacey. But other people find it actually really pleasant. And in that way, it can be also enhanced concentration. I feel that way too. I have um, a complicated relationship with breath awareness. <laughs> like, it's just sometimes I love it and sometimes I hate it. You know, I'm just admitting that. Just so I don't know how you feel. For me, I'm much more natural with this uh, settling the mind or sky gazing. It's just where I want to be. But then there are other times when I really need the breath. So it's not black or white here. It's not one or the other. Start your session with some breath awareness. So you ground. And then if you want to stay with it, stay with it. It's beautiful. And it can take you all the way. But if this entices you, then let it go like training wheels let it go and open the eyes and then settle the mind in its natural state i want to read a little quote from one of the really most my favorite books that teach on this technique it's called natural liberation padmasambhava's teachings on the six bardos so on page 92 of the English version, he talks about settling the mind in its natural state. And he says, in settling the mind in its natural state, there are also three parts. While keeping the body and speech as they were before, because he was just talking about settling the mind and settling the body in its natural state and settling the um, speech in its natural state, which in another way you could say is doing breathing natural breath and not talking (laughs) speech suddenly speech in its natural state is like don't even recite mantras (laughs) don't even recite prayers just go real quiet like a lute whose string has been cut right that's the settling the speech in its natural state and then in settling the body in its natural state is just sitting in a comfortable relaxed way that's aligned with gravity so you don't have to effort and be still. So then, what is settling the mind in its natural state? Well, he says, just like in the prior categories, this section also has three. He says, while keeping the body and speech as they were before, meaning quiet and still, let your mind be lucid without engaging any thoughts concerning earlier or later deceptive appearances of the three times, meaning Don't get caught up in thoughts about the past, present, and future. He says, don't even think about, um, yeah, he says, inwardly, settle the mind evenly without engaging in any good thoughts, such as prayers or deity meditations visualizations don't do anything with the mind settle evenly without without engaging in even positive thoughts then on the secret most secret level so you always in tibetan buddhism you're always having these outer inner and secret categories so on the secret you settle the mind in its natural state by letting it be just as it is ah (laughs) steadily clearly and lucidly in the space in front of you. So that's what I'm saying. It's like imagine as if you're almost like watching the space of the mind in front of you. So you settle the mind in its natural state by letting it be just as it is, steadily, clearly, and lucidly in the space in front of you, in the mind's own mode of existence without bringing to mind any of the mentally engaging thoughts of the view, meaning philosophy, like emptiness or thoughts like that, as well as meditation techniques which entail mental grasping. So don't think about anything. 
And when he says here, settle the mind in its own mode of existence, you might wonder what that is. That's its natural state of stillness and clarity and stability. So this is really, this is why the book is called Natural Liberation. It's called Rang Drol. Rang means natural or self, like internal, like reflexive, actually. And Drol means liberation. So natural liberation, Rang Drol, is this unraveling, this letting go. It's actually a process of subtraction rather than addition. And it can be a great relief, <laughs> you know, especially if you're a PhD student. <laughs> it's like you need to balance the doing and the non-doing. This is your undoing in the good way, in the good sense of the word. It's pretty cool, huh? Yeah, is that interesting to you? That's good stuff. So then in a little while, we're going to take another step forward into shamatha without a sign. But I don't feel like we're ready yet because I want you to really understand what it is that we're doing here and not just kind of come along for the ride, la la la. <laughs> like I want you to understand like what we're doing. We're developing stability, clarity, and relaxation. We're training the mind to stay, to have a certain degree of focus which is good for us in all areas of our life. And then we're learning how to not be so fused with our thoughts. Right? So we, we unfuse from the face plant with our thoughts and we get more space and perspective. And that's where we come into like emptiness, you know, like the emptiness of thoughts. They come and they go, they arise and they pass, they don't have solidity. So we develop more of that experience of spaciousness through settling the mind in its natural state. And we learned how to self-liberate or naturally liberate these thoughts and appearances as they come into the mind. So what's cool about this meditation, I remember this really hit me once on retreat with Alan. He was like, in settling the mind in its natural state, you're not preferring one state over the other. And I've heard Eve talk about this too. So you're not preferring bliss over fatigue or discomfort. You're just aware of it. And you're resting in that space within which all of this stuff is popping up and passing and dissolving. It's a very liberating, it's a naturally liberating practice. So then from here, we will go perhaps when we feel ready to take you there to the next step, which is Shamatha without a sign, because breath awareness and even settling the mind in its natural state are two techniques called shamatha with a sign, meaning with an anchor. The anchor can be the breath, the anchor can be the mind, the anchor can be a mantra, the anchor can be a visualization, the anchor can be staring at a pebble or a stick. They, there are teachings for the, you know, the mountain yogis who didn't have a lot of fancy stuff. Padmasambhava in another part of this book says, just take a stick, put it on the ground in front of you and gaze at it and stay focused on it without distraction. That's an anchor. So training with the anchor and then when you're ready, releasing the anchor and practicing shamatha without an anchor, without a sign. And that's called awareness of awareness. We've flirted with that already a little bit. But if you don't have the stability and the clarity and the relaxation and the capacity to kind of like be here for real, uh, it can be you can just go over your head too much, too soon. So if you can, be consistent with these classes because we are building an arc here and we're moving through these wonderful Lojong slogans as well that teach us a relative level, like how to be in the world with more ease. Yeah. Yeah, Eric says, I found it to be challenging in a positive way, though, from focus on the breath to focus on the mind. Exactly. It's kind of like taking the, you're in the intermediate level now with that one. 
But I don't want to create an illusion of like higher or lower or hierarchy because breath awareness is brilliant and even the Buddha said it can take you all the way and that's true. So, but it is less tactile, so it can be a bit more nebulous, this mindfulness of the mind, which is the fourth foundation of mindfulness. I mean, the third foundation of mindfulness. It's there in the sutras, this practice. It's not explicitly taught in the practice. This particular way that it's taught is very, it's rooted in in earlier Buddhism, but it's very characteristic of the Tibetan style of teaching shamatha. Okay, thank you, Heidi. Says, I appreciate the in-depth teaching. Is this part of the Dzogchen practice? Yes, this is like Dzogchen shamatha. (laughs) which is pretty cool. Dzogchen means great perfection, right? So it's a Nyingma tradition of uh, Buddhism. It's like the old lineage that came from India in the 8th century, 7th and 8th century into Tibet and was preserved there and developed there. A very rich tradition. And that's my primary seat. That's where I'm trained uh, mostly. Yeah, Walt says it didn't allow me to drift as much as staying in one groove. Did not allow me to drift as much as staying in one groove. Interesting. Yeah, I know. I, I've moved you, right? I, we had about 10 minutes with each phase. And I feel like that's good because it, it keeps you on your toes. <laughs> and so, yeah, new technique, a shifting in the sit does, a, does keep you on your toes a bit and doesn't allow you to kind of drift or sink into a one groove. Okay, so now what we'll do is look at slogan number 14, which is an interesting slogan. Um, I'll paste it here in the chat. Seeing confusion as the four kayas is unsurpassable shunyata protection. <laughs> this one, I get to unpack this one. So some slogans are really straightforward, like be grateful to everyone or don't expect applause. This one's a little more like, let's pack a huge Dharma teaching in one line. (laughs) So, and interesting, another translation from Alan Wallace is uh, worth sharing too. It's slightly different. By meditating on delusive appearances, as the four embodiments, emptiness becomes the best protection. So delusive appearances in this context are like, is confusion, like the other translation. Trul, trul is a Tibetan word which means like apparition or illusion, mirage, the kind of confusion that we have. I mean, have you noticed uh, that what we think is not always accurate? <laughs> you know, there's this kind of way that we experience the world in a not so clear, uh, from a not so clear lens, and that can cause confusion or delusive appearances, deluded perception. And so what they're saying here is that if you meditate on all these comings and goings, these delusive appearances, these phenomena that appear to our senses, to our mind, we can actually, through through insight, understand them to be the four kayas or the four embodiments. And then when we do that, we realize the empty nature of all of this, and it becomes a protection for us. So I'm going to unpack that. What does that mean? So we've talked about emptiness also before in terms of like it appears, like phenomena appears in one way, but actually it's delusive because it actually truly exists in a different way. Like we think things are permanent, but they're not. They're impermanent. So those are delusive appearances. The computer, the book, if I think this is permanent, I'm deluded because it's actually impermanent. Because it was created, it will someday be uncreated. It will come and go. And so um, I want to read from 
a wonderful uh, commentary. If you're curious on getting a root text for the Lojong, this great path of awakening by Jamgun Kongtrol is a classic. It's one of my main sources. It's not very thick. The Great Path of Awakening. And he gives a little commentary to this, and then I'll unpack the commentary. And the way that he translates, the translator here is, uh, McLeod, is Ken McLeod, actually, translated this book, and he translates this slogan a little differently. So I'll read that as well so that you can perhaps have a better understanding of the meaning. This 14th slogan is translated in this book as the ultimate protection is emptiness. Know what arises is confusion to be the four aspects of being. <laughs> so there are three very different translations here. So what Jamgun Kongtrol says is, in general, all appearances, and particularly adverse conditions, are like the distress experienced when you dream of being burnt in a fire or swept away by a flood. The confusion, the confused appearances of mind are invested with a reality that they do not have. It's like you're taking the rope for a, to be a snake, right? It's not there. So he says, the confused appearances of mind are invested with a reality that they do not have. It is rigorously established that, although these appearances arise, there is not even a particle of true existence in them. When you rest in a state in which appearances simply arise, but there is no clinging to them, the dharmakaya aspect is that they are empty in nature. Dharmakaya is one of the kayas. So the dharmakaya aspect is that they are empty in nature. The nirmanakaya aspect is they appear with clarity. So the nirmanakaya is the emanation. I'll unpack this in a moment. So in the nirmanakaya aspect is they appear with clarity. The Sambhogakaya aspect is that this emptiness and clarity occur together. And the Svabhavakakaya, the fourth aspect, is that these are inseparable. This key instruction to rest evenly without grasping at origin, location, or cessation of thoughts or appearances points out the four kayas. It is the armor of view the protection circle of emptiness and the supreme instruction that cuts off confusion. <laughs> okay, so what is this? So I want to talk a little bit about paper tigers here because it's a beautiful metaphor for emptiness. Chogyam Trungpa, who has another wonderful commentary on the Lo Jong slogans, talks about understanding emptiness to be, understanding phenomena to be empty is like understanding a paper tiger. So when we see into the empty nature, meaning the impermanent, insubstantial nature of thoughts, our ego, or everything, we start to become more sane and less caught in the mirage or the hallucination of thoughts, emotions, projections, and so on. So when we look at a thought like, I'm wrong, or I'm bad, or I'm not good enough, or I'm the best, if you try to look at the source of that thought, the location of the thought, or the destination of this thought, you can't find exactly where it is. So you begin to see that they appear like paper tigers, which is an old Asian metaphor to, in Tibet, maybe in China. So at first this can be scary, like, what, it's not there? 
It's like a paper tiger. But you start to realize that this flimsy kind of insubstantial nature of your own thinking and thoughts is liberating and is actually wonderful. And so it's unable to harm us. And so in that way, it becomes the shunyata, the understanding of the empty nature of thoughts, appearances, phenomena even. When we understand that, what he's saying here is that if we can really abide in that deeper realization, we're free of harm. Like no self, no problem. (laughs) One of my favorite one-liners. Of course, we could get cut or get in a car crash and, you know, get hurt. Of course, on a relative level, all of that is true. So we're talking like deep yogic level here, that when you understand emptiness, there's actually no ego, no self to be harmed. It's a deep, deep truth. It's a truth that perhaps we don't really realize until we leave this body at the moment of our own death, right? That ultimately there is no birth and no death. But even if we go and go stop thinking like I took us to the extreme, but even on a subtle day-to-day level, that, that protective circle of emptiness can be experienced by less clinging, less fixation, less reactivity, more wisdom. Seeing that thoughts are like paper tigers. People's criticisms and words are like paper tigers. Sure, we can take them seriously, but we also don't have to let them destroy us. Okay, so what are the four kayas? So the four kayas means the four bodies or the four dimensions. So don't think of them as certain places, but more like realities that you tap into, different dimensions. The word in Tibetan is the kusum. Kusum. Put in the chat. So, kaya means body or dimension. The first is dharma kaya. And that means truth body. Truth body. I'll just paste these here, my notes here for you, because sometimes it's easier. It's very interesting to understand these, because it helps us understand reality. So, dharma kaya is the absolute dimension it is the formless dimension it's called the truth body because in this context the dharma is the truth is truth is is the Tao, right it's the absolute nature kaya is body or dimension that is the formless dimension the unmanifest samboga kaya literally means the enjoyment body And what that is, is a slightly more manifest dimension, but not like we are in the material world. It is a dimension of light, sound, and bliss. It said that is the dimension where the angels are, or where the deities abide, the Taras, the Avalokiteshvara, the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, the beings of light. So for those who have a thin veil, who have purified their karmas and their perceptions to the point that they can actually tap into that, that can happen, but you have to have a a sensitivity, and oftentimes children will have that. We can have that as well if we're not too locked into solidification. The next is nirmanakaya. Nirmanakaya means emanation or illusory body. It's that same wor- word of trul, trul. Actually, the word for nirmanakai in Tibetan is troku, or often pronounced toku, which means an emanation being, like somebody who's incarnated as a high-level, highly realized being to come back around and benefit beings. So toku, toku organ was a great teacher. So it means they're nirmanakayas, they're emanation bodies in this physical world. This dimension is the nirmanakaya that we're in. And so when 
when Jamgen Kangtro on a very kind of subtle level, let me just say one more thing. A really helpful way to understand the three kayas is um, looking at water and the different manifestations of water, the material of water. So it's said that Nirmanakaya, the most form, the more, most solidified, is ice. Sambhogakaya is water. And Dharmakaya is like steam. So it's like this reality is all made of the same essential nature, the essential substances, but these three kayas are three different kind of levels of rarefication or solidification. So they're not different places like heaven and hell or anything like that. So it depends on our perception. Christ may have been a nirmanakaya, a manifestation of the dharmakaya, right, of God. When Christ said, uh, I am son of God, he may have meant that he was made of God, right? Made of the dharmakaya, the absolute dimension. There might be some correspondence there. So a common way to explain these th three kayas, and then we have a fourth kaya, which I'll explain in a moment, is to understand how they manifest. So Jamgen Kongtrul said that dharmakayas is empty in nature, shunyata. So it has the nature of emptiness, the interdependent fullness of everything, that akashic field, that pregnant zero. He also said then nirmanakaya, which is then the most manifest, appears as clarity, luminosity. Which is interesting because in other teachings it also says that it manifests as unceasing compassion. So that that absolute dimension, when it manifests, as it is always ever-present everywhere, its essential nature is love and compassion. Right? That's when all the great masters say, it's all about love. It's true. So that nirmanakaya manifests as compassion unceasing compassion. That is the nature of our mind, too. And then Sambhogakaya is the um, energy in between, or the union of the two, clarity and empty nature. And that's that bliss body of luminosity, subtle vibration, subtle manifestation of sound and light. So emptiness and clarity occurring together is the Sambhogakaya. And then the fourth is Svabhavikakaya. Not easy to say. And that is simply saying it's beyond all the prior three. <laughs> it's the ultimate ultimate. Even more ultimate than the Dharmakaya. So I'm just going to post my notes there so you have them. You can always cut and paste whatever you want or just leave it. Walt is asking, what is the difference, if any, between a Nirmanakaya toku and a Bodhisattva? Well, a toku could be a Bodhisattva because the a Bodhisattva vows to come back again and again in order to help beings. And so that toku is just the natural kind of mechanism by which a Bodhisattva would come back. But then in the Mahayana teachings, they have 10 levels of the Bodhisattva. You know, because you can have like, like me, for example, <laughs> just be humble here. You know, I've made the aspiration to awaken for the benefit of others, but I'm not like, you know, an enlightened being yet, maybe. <laughs> no, I'm not. And so that, that I'm not like a fully 10th level realized Bodhisattva yet. Because that's a Buddha, actually. And, but, you know, other great masters might be, you know, third, fourth, fifth level bodhisattvas. So there's the maha bodhisattva and then there's the regular bodhisattva. So I don't think you have to be a maha bodhisattva to be a toku. I mean, in order to reincarnate, you can be a little bit 
lower on the rung. <laughs> so, so emptiness becomes the best protection when you realize that all delusive phenomena are actually manifestations of the four kayas. What they're saying is, is that actually everything is already perfect just as it is. That even like the worst of the worst phenomena is actually an expression of the absolute dimension. So if you can see all phenomena, the car crash, the orgasm, everything in between, as expressions of the primordial ground, the dharmakaya, then you understand the true nature of what's really going on. <laughs> and so then why is it protection? Why is emptiness the protective? Well, another way to define emptiness, which I really love, is openness or open dimension of being. The great Indian Buddhist Acharya Asanga states that emptiness is an aesthetic continuum with all possibilities. An aesthetic continuum with all possibilities. Doesn't that feel a lot more interesting and inspiring than emptiness? So when you can rest in even just a small hair's breadth of realization, of shunyata, of emptiness, or this aesthetic continuum with all possibilities, it has by nature a protective quality. And really what that brings is wisdom. So understanding emptiness is called prajna. Pragna, or P R A J with a s J with an N with a squiggle A, means wisdom into or insight into the way things are. And when you're with somebody who has that kind of wisdom, whether it's a m teacher or a, a deep practitioner, there is a protective, safe quality. There's a quality of like a deeper truth a place of refuge. And then we can become that as well through our practice, through realizing emptiness through prajna. Prajna can also be intuitive understanding. But really in the Buddhist context, what does wisdom mean, prajna? It means wisdom into this aesthetic continuum with all possibilities, this understanding it viscerally for yourself that nothing internally and externally has a hair's breadth of solidity and permanence. So try that on and see how that fits for you. <laughs> this is a very deep slogan. The main thing, right, if you don't remember any of those kayas, what's that, this, the other thing, the main thing to take from that is that that, that all appearances, while they're delusive, when you get down to their essence, are actually quite pure. That they're all expressions from the ground of being. Or you could say they're all light rays, sun rays from the sun. And due to different karmic patterns and propensities, we experience the world in different ways. But at their essence, the Buddhist news is good news, that everything is good. Good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end. Tracing back to the Dharmakaya. So we have to find ways to remember that and to feel that for ourselves. Instead of getting stuck in the, the rut that the modern media and the world and the news wants us to believe. We have a couple minutes. Does anybody have a comment? You feel like you've got, you, you understood the slogan a little bit? These four kaya teachings came from the Mahayana teachings called the Di Diamond Sutra. 
associated with what's called the third turning of the wheel, where the Buddha taught on emptiness. But then later, the teaching says that the third turning of the wheel was given, but people weren't ready for it, so those teachings got kind of hidden and then revealed later by great bodhisattvas. And these teachings were revealed by Maitreya, the bodhisattva Maitreya. He gave them to the master Asanga, who we spoke of earlier. So that's where these teachings first arise. You're not going to see these in the earlier Theravadan tradition. This this way of explaining these different dimensions. Mahayana gets a lot more cosmic. <laughs> you know, the early teachings are beautiful in their groundedness. And then the Mahayana pops it open a lot and starts talking about Buddhas and Buddha fields and multiple Buddhas and um, deities and bodhisattvas and Yeah. Different dimensions. Okay, dear Dharma brothers and sisters, let's go ahead and just drop in. Just let all of these ideas just land within you and just trusting that they come to fruition when the time is right and Really trusting in the beauty of these ancient teachings that have been preserved for so long, coming here to us now to help us find our way, to feel that protective, you could almost say like a Vajra tent of protection, of rainbow light around us and around our world. We dedicate the merit of our study and our practice for the benefit of all beings everywhere. Thank you. Well, thank you, everybody. It's 9 o'clock. Have a wonderful evening. You can unmute to say goodbye if you'd like to. And we'll see you. Eve, we'll see you next week. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank the you other so much. I wanted to make real quick is that I am going on a writing retreat in November for most of the month. So I'm pulling back from a lot of my teaching. And Eve will be holding most of the month, but we'll also have some wonderful guest speakers. So um, I think I'll see you guys one more time before I go. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> I have to look at the calendar. So thanks, everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank thanks. You. Thank you. Actually, yeah. I'm going to see you before I go. So this is my last class for a while. <laughs> so bye, everybody. You're in good hands. How will we ever do Shamato without a sign? December 2nd. <laughs> I know. Now you're like, what? Evil, evil, throw it down when she's feeling ready for you. When you're ready, when you you got to show you're ready, guys. Come on. No, I'm kidding. How do you flex your shamatha muscle? You can't. <laughs> it's all secret level. Um, I'll be back on December second, so we'll see. We'll see where you are when I get back. All right. Take care. Thank you.